Hello and welcome to Missions and Visions coming to you live from Beijing. This is a live webinar focusing on hot button issues concerning China and the world. The program is also part of CGTN's Global Arena program. I'm Wang Guan, host and news anchor here at CGTN. Our topic today, does China have a global image problem and if so, how to fix it? Polls from Gallup and Pew Research, among other Institutions show that the views of China are turning increasingly negative. In fact, it is getting unprecedentedly unfavorable. Was that about politics, culture, or just out of fear for the rise of a non-Western power? Did the West get China wrong? To answer some of these questions, we're very happy to be joined today by Lawrence J. Brahm, an American writer, political economist, director, and producer. Also by Frank Siren, best-selling author, journalist, and documentary filmmaker. Carl Jia is host of Silk and Steel. Last but certainly not least, Teng Ji Meng is senior research fellow at Center for China and Globalization. Welcome, guys. Welcome to this uh, special program. We do have our participants from around the world actually tuning in from universities and institutions joining us uh, for this discussion later on. We do welcome your engagement, your intervention by asking your own very questions, your very own questions regarding this issue. Does China have a global image issue? And if so, how to fix it? Carl, let me turn to you, if I may. Did the West get China wrong? For a long time, I remember when I came to uh, United States in 1990, I used to read New York Times religiously. Every day, I searched for news about my homeland, China. But the, the China that was presented in the page of New York Times resembled nothing like the homeland I left behind. I used to chalk it up as uh, Western ignorance about China because I thought, you know, it's just very hard for Westerners to understand China. The East and West twin shall never meet. But as I became uh, more politically aware and as, as I studied the Western coverage in other countries like Russia, for example, I realized China is the re Western reporting on China is not an exception, but rather the rule. Um, the rule is there has been a lot of intentionally misinformation uh, about China being reported in the West, in the Western mainstream media. I'm speaking from my experience living in the United States. I live in the U.S. almost 30 years. Most people on the street, they don't understand China. There's a lot of ignorance about China. So the only news they receive from China is from their mainstream media, and a lot of times, what the mainstream media present to their readers back home is a very, very distorted picture. Uh, it, it, they chose to laser focus on every negative aspect of China and then blow it up 100 times. Frank, uh, let me turn to you. Uh, where do you think China's global image problem, if there is one, lies? It's a complicated process. On one side, the Chinese don't have a really long tradition in explaining themselves. They've been the middle kingdom. They didn't really care about uh, the neighbors. Um, now you have to explain yourself. And on the other side, the Western countries, they could set the rules for the world. They could set the global rules. So they have no tradition of listening to other um, um, perspectives to other countries. And now with this new wave of globalization, we need more to understand each other. Indeed, we need a mutual empathy uh, to close the gap of information among other things. And obviously COVID is not making things easier. If you think about the, the number and the frequency of people to people exchange, which is at the very, it's very sad state of affairs. Lawrence, uh, same question to you. Does China have a global image problem? Well, China, yes, basically you have a Western media that has more or less a consensual view on China. And with particularly the United States during the time of uh, Vice President Cheney, who removed legal restrictions, or we could say standards for journalists, where they had to report both sides of a story. So the outcome is that in journalism in America today, you have really the journalism of parties. You have like CNN and the New York Times or with the Democratic Party, Fox, Wall Street Journal, Republican. In a way, they're voicing a prefixed editorial view as opposed to looking at the news. Um, at the same time, from what we've just heard, it's traditionally 
a characteristic of Chinese people not to brag, to be very humble and low key when expressing their views or wanting to express a, a particular opinion. It's done with innuendo. This is part of the culture. It's the same with looking at the Chinese media. However, in Western media, the way Western society works, particularly in the United States of America, people like to you know, promote themselves, and they promote themselves very aggressively. And likewise, they'll promote their views and ideas aggressively. And therefore, the communication gap is quite wide, particularly when it comes to media. Professor Tang, as a Chinese scholar who traveled the world, who studied the relations between China and the rest of the world, are you upset by how China is viewed by the rest of the world and mostly the West? Well, absolutely. I think um, I'm pretty much disturbed by what I've been seeing and witnessing and experiencing when I was traveling around the world. And this is why I've been devoting myself to teach and to try to help students to be able to communicate our ideas and understand their ideas. And so in a sense, I'm uh, pretty much kind of caught up in between these two cultures, let's say the East and the West. And what, what makes me so happy right now is that with the increasing, uh, increasing effort made by the Chinese government, to open up China to, in a sense, to integrate China into the international community. China has been relatively successful, I think, in conveying and con communicating our ideas. And I think most importantly, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to accept and to receive new ideas from the outside world. Uh, for example, uh, I've seen so many cases in point uh, in academic exchange more scholars are traveling and traveling around the world, especially in Europe, in North America, in South America, and even right now in Africa. And so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic in, in seeing this very trend, this very globalization going on in terms of uh, kind of uh, helping China uh, and bring closer the rest of the world to China. Frank, let me turn to you. The, the West is a big and uh, vague concept that uh, we all know the West is not a monolithic whole. Uh, we have Europeans, we have Americans, some even categorize uh, Latin America as part of the West. Um, as a European, uh, how do you look at the perception of China among Euro the European uh, citizens, especially the ordinary folks? Um, do you think language is a key problem? Because you talk about the fact that China is having a hard time getting its voice out, but let's face it, English has been the lingua franca of the world for the past 100 years. But we have to say it's quite a normal process in history, um, the way China is treated right now. I don't say that it's a good process, but if you look at uh, um, how Germany was treated in the Industrial Revolution when they were growing against um, um, the, the, the British people, and the British people invented the slogan made in Germany to bad-mouthing um, um, the German industry uh, products. The British Empire was looking down on America until America was so strong that they couldn't look down on them anymore. So this is a quite normal process in history, but we shouldn't accept it. We should try to make it better this time. We should try to be able, in a better way, to um, see the world in each other perspectives. And there's a lot to learn from both sides um, to understand why China looks on the world from a different perspective, because they have a different history, they have different culture, um, there's so many people, they have a, um, a, a different path to go. And on the other side, the Chinese should understand why um, the Western people are probably now full of fear because they think China is so big and Asia is so big and they still like their life and their values and their theory that they probably have to change their values and their lifestyles because of the rise in China. Um, at the end, it's actually a good process because a real multipolarian world order is emerging. Yeah, Lawrence, you know, Frank brought up a very interesting concept that is uh, we're becoming a multipolar world. I mean, let's look beyond the West for a second. China's perception is not that negative. If you ask a Russian, uh, an Arab, uh, how do you look at the fact that China is viewed very differently? Do you think China has some 
you know, very positive perceptions from, for example, like I said, the Arab world. Well, first of all, if you're looking at Africa, for an example, since you mentioned this, um, China simply wrote off all of its debt um, that, that Africa owed in one go. I mean, this is very, very different than anything that the IMF or World Bank would have ever done or any of the Western lenders. And uh, in the case of China's own experience and development, a lot of it was built around building infrastructure, uh, basic infrastructure, roads, communication, uh, clean water systems. All of these things were priorities before trying to evolve into any kind of political framework that Western countries might wish to see. And other countries around the world for their own uh, cultural reasons have their own reasons for evolving their own political systems that will not be the same as Western countries as well. But it's the core focus on infrastructure that allows an economy to move forward, allows people to become educated. If you don't have lights in your home, how are your kids going to be able to read or even get on the computer or even be able to connect to Internet? These things are all about infrastructure. And I think China's own development experience has been very realistic for a lot of the developing world. And that's why they are able to you know, communicate. But there's also cultural reasons for this mutual understanding. If you want to really look at the quintessential difference between Chinese thinking and Western thinking, it really comes down, or all Asian thinking for that matter, it really comes down to one point, And that's duality versus non-duality. And in a Western context, particularly in American context, we're always being taught to think about right, wrong, good, bad, black, white. And the winner always has to win and the loser always has to lose. It's ingrained into our thinking from movies, television shows, from the time we grow up to our very sports, football, basketball. Everything is about this polemic winner, loser, right, wrong. And of course, it extends into the politics as well, where you have political parties who can't agree on anything. And that's totally different in an Asian context. Professor Tung, let me turn to you. I mean, Kishore Mabubani, for example, argues that China is, quote unquote, clumsy when explaining and defending itself. Um, don't you think that is the case sometimes? And how can China really solve that issue? Yes and no. I think yes, is because the China has always been, or Chinese culture in general has always been known as, um, I mean, Kissinger also talked about China being the subtle, the sophisticated mind, the, the unspoken subtlety. And in this sense, I think, yes, this is kind of clumsy. We don't, we don't speak too much. We don't, like uh, 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 Ram said, we don't brag too much. We don't promote ourselves. Uh, but in recent years, I think China is increasingly outspoken. We are increasingly kind of uh, um, loud in speaking our minds because of China's exposure to the international community. As a foreign language teacher, I've been teaching Chinese students to speak loudly, clearly, and logically. And like Ambassador Ching Gang just said recently in Washington, D.C., he said it's not China, it's not the way we China deal with the world. Our way to deal with the world is to seek harmony, to seek this harmony while keeping the difference. And so that philosophy dominates the Chinese mindset. Now, language is a problem. Language as is spoken is basically the most important means to communicate ourselves. And which is why I think that in the current world, like it or not, English is the lingua franca. And so we have to learn and we have to study the language. We have to be analytical. We, the idea to study the language well is to study the, the minds, the way of thinking, the culture, tradition behind this very language. You have to be able to study the culture, the tradition, and also the very logic behind. Uh, this very language used to express ourselves. Now let's open it up for questions from our audience members from around the world. Please raise your hand if you have a question, dear friends. Good to see all of you there. Hello. Who has a question? 
Okay. Um, the first question goes to Zhou Reinan, please. So, um, how would you describe China's image now? Uh, let me elaborate on that quickly. You know, Western reporting on China seems to be monotonous, like a state with little place for public discussion. However, on Weibo, China's Twitter, for instance, people are ex ex expressing strong views on either end of the spectrum about national and international affairs. So will this make the China story more difficult to tell, or um, it's a chance to tell a more layered and nuanced story? All right. Carl? There's always a lot of chance to tell the layer and nuanced story of China, but currently, the Western mainstream media has decided to wage propaganda instead. Um, you know, it's, the, the airwave is clogged up with anti-China narratives. So if they can just get back to simply tell the story, and, and like many of the guests have expressed a wish for actually building a cultural bridge of understanding, that will be ideal. But we're not there right now, unfortunately, because the the rising tensions between us and china and there have been a lot of <clears throat> intentional misinformation about china in western media and uh, luckily there are some popular chinese platform uh for example TikTok, that's gaining more popularity the advantage of TikTok is people can see uh, average people in china living their life and they realize the chinese just like the rest of us are human beings i think that really does a lot to humanize china china all right short answer. all right great omar i see you over there omar floor is yours Hey, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Umar. I'm an Iraqi, been in China for 26 years. So as I'm an Iraqi, which is a country being invaded by the many West countries, as I've been in China for 26 years, I will send a question to the three principals here. Uh, I want to ask about like, uh, as I'm an Iraqi and I've been in China for 26 years, as these days and seeing that in the West media, They've been a lot of lies in the Twitter, I can see in the mini newspapers. Why the media, with the media is blocking like many Arab countries and blocking now China also? I mean, first of all, you have a very clear agenda that's coming out of Washington. You have to understand American policy making comes from two cities. It comes from Washington, D.C. and New York. And it's basically also connected with financial markets given the fact that um, the entire government depends on uh, debt and that debt ultimately is, buys back its own debt. That debt in turn goes into the capital markets and it goes where? It usually goes into the social media, the sort of what they call FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. I mean, it goes into basically these, these stocks and a few more like Twitter. Um, the advantage of these companies is that they're actually, because they're tech, they are gathering information on you, these internet companies, constantly. So there's about something like Facebook has about 5,000 points on every person who uses it. So they know what you eat, they know what you like, they know what you don't like, and they can align themselves very quickly with the mm. hand that feeds them, with, again, the, the debt markets, which are then coming from buy back from the Fed and, of course, that's respecting or responding to policy agendas. And if we're talking about in a post-colonial world that you really have a kind of uh, still, it's not post-colonial, you still have a kind of new colonialism. It's involved in financial markets, it's involved in trade, it's involved in other aspects of control. They don't want first of all, rising powers to have a voice. They don't want the third world to have a voice. They don't want to have, to have the countries that they once decolonized to have an independent voice. And they're not looking to allow the creativity to emerge from those nations. So they're continuing to push an agenda, um, a demonizing agenda. And the social media networks allow for that to be um, managed very well, very efficiently through either blocking information or, in the case, um, observing what people's fears are and playing on those fears aggressively with information or misinformation 
Again, mm -hmm. anything can be edited. I know so often here, I've known so many journalists over the years, and I would see people reporting things, and then at the end of the day, their newspapers and their networks are not reporting what they have observed. And that's because editorials come in and said, change the story. That's not the story we want to tell. And many journalists in confidence will also reflect that this is their own frustrations, uh, that even if they want to report a story in a particular way, they can't because the agenda yeah. at the home editorial side will be different because it's again it's reflecting political agendas it's reflecting financial agendas it's reflecting agendas from advertisers and those in turn are also very much politically driven by lobbying groups etc so there's a whole yeah. matrix of forces there that are um leading to this outcome yeah i'm reminded of the uh, noam chomsky's book on manufacturing consent okay the next question goes to zhou yun I'm Zhu Yun, also from Communication University of China. I have one question for Professor Teng. Uh, we know that never before has public discourse been so important, spawning a war of narratives and new counter discursive strategies in international politics. A recent example was Joe Biden's Summit for Democracy in December last year, which promoted China to hold its own online version of the event. I want to know how can China could be more proactive and take the lead rather than just playing tit for tat. Thank you. That's a complicated question. I, um, I, um, I would point you to Ambassador Ching Gang, who is now stationed in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is a gentleman who has been in diplomacy, who has been serving Chinese uh, in the Chinese diplomatic society a community for a long time. His English is very good. Uh, he knows better, I mean, he knows the world much better as he has been traveling extensively with Chinese leaders and Chinese statesmen around the world. And so, first thing I would say, uh, let China continue to expose itself to the rest of the world. Uh, let us continue to be exposed and to engage ourselves uh, to the rest of the world. Ambassador Ching Gong's latest um, uh, remarks made in the U.S. is a is a shining example to communicate with the world and to stand out most prominently, not in that very conf confrontational manner, but a little bit of kind of tit, uh, tit for tat. I, I that's my interpretation. Now, when you're engaged in that very kind of a game, you have to know your part. You have to know your rival and you have to be able to speak the language of your rival or your competitor. And so in this case, I think the example Professor, uh, uh, Ambassador Ching Gong evoked, the American football, is a typical case in point. If you need to prevail, if you want to prevail, understand your rival, understand the very secret behind your rival and or your competitor, and then come up with a solution, come up with your own solution. Uh, instead of um, doing this thing in a defensive way, but then try to come up this very um, option or alternative or solution in advance. I think the trouble with China right now is that we don't have, a, we don't have an option. We don't have an option in advance. The idea, I think, to cope with this very world is to come up with your idea and to come up with the solution and try uh, and try that on a perhaps on an error and trial basis. The next question goes to Bai Te Si Petros. Uh, thank you, Wang Guan, all the speakers. My name is Petros, and I joined you from the San Island of Cyprus after spending a few years in Beijing. Uh, interestingly, I run a community that helps young foreigners find jobs in China, and I have a question for Professor Tang. In what ways do young people in East and West influence each other's views? And how can we build more bridges for these young leaders of tomorrow and strengthen our mutual understanding, other than learning English or encouraging them to learn English and Chinese? Good, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the great question. I think one way to uh, bridge the gap or increase uh, this very mutual understanding is uh, to bring ourselves closer, uh, spiritually 
and uh, geographically and even intellectually, and most importantly, I think intellectually, uh, to bring ourselves closely, closer intellectually, first thing I think is learn uh, and learn mutually our uh, mutual cultural traditions, our histories, and perhaps our geographies, our politics, our political institutions. And so in a sense, it's all about bringing ourselves to that very point where we can actually share one common language, one common thing. But then the world is different. And the point that we come to this very uh, converging point is not to, in a sense, to converge ourselves, is not to conform ourselves. I think the, money, the most beneficial point is, at that very converging point is to understand not just the very different, uh, the very uh, uh, similarities, but also the differences. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Professor Tung. Thanks for this nuanced uh, perspectives. Uh, understand that Frank uh, Siren will have to leave us. Thank you so much for, for coming on our show, Frank. Uh, come back again, please. Finally, I would like to invite uh, three of our guests to share their final thoughts, maybe in one sentence or two. Uh, Professor Tung, why do I go with you? Well, young people, especially the Z generation, are tech savvy, they're knowledgeable, they're intellectual, and they're open, they're also very inclusive. Now, spot on, just go on and know, you, know the world around you, speak to the world around you, interact yourself with the world around you. Thank you. All righty, Lawrence. Just tell human stories. I think that's the most important thing. And if you look at the methodology of a lot of media, like the New York Times, will always start off with a human story, an individual who has suffered or who has, you know, achieved something. <laughs> and so I think it's the human story that touches people faster rather than just trying to send a message or put forward a point of view. Um, do it in a subtle way through an individual's life and uh, what they have achieved or overcome. And uh, I think that can be something understood by people everywhere. Mm -hmm. Carl. I think uh, Professor Tang and uh, Lawrence said everything. <laughs> they said about pretty high, right? <laughs> I 100% I, I agree. Tell the human story. Uh, be more engaging uh, for, for, the, for the, especially for the youngins who have the language skills. Alrighty, I want to thank all of you and also our uh, audience members for tuning in today. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, Carl, Lawrence, uh, Frank earlier, and Professor Tong, we learned so much from you guys. And thank you for watching Missions and Visions. They will do it for this edition. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Do stay tuned for our future episodes. Thank you for watching.